I'm related to Parry Parish. Um, he was my great grand uncle. And my father was Pierce McLaughlin and, and his father was Alfred McLaughlin. And his father was Alfred McLaughlin as well. And he uh, that Alfred McLaughlin was uh, Emily Pierce's husband. Now, uh, could you tell me about his early years? Well, what I know of his early years is that he was, well, he was always uh, very interested in, in drama and culture and in the Irish language and the Irish culture. And his mother was a Brady, originally from County Mead. And obviously there was Irish there at that time. And she, she inspired him, I suppose, with, with stories of Cook Holland and mm. great Irish heroes. Publicly, Park McPierce, also he was a great orator. On the other, mm. on the other side, of, side of the coin, he was supposed to be a very shy person. And they say that acting um, is the shy man's revenge. And he was passionate about plays and so on. Even as, uh, even as a child mm. at home, they'd be doing plays with, with his sisters, with his brother and that, and even dressing up as a priest and saying mass at home. She would have been a very traditional Irish Catholic, mm -hmm. uh, from a very traditional Irish Catholic background. Yeah. And um, I suspect that he, uh, she made it very clear that whatever his private religious beliefs were, they were not to be um, in any way part of the life of their children. I get you. Um, and I think it's, you know, in terms of their Patrick and William's religious beliefs were shaped by their mother much mm. more so than by their father. I think Patrick is aware that his father um, might have been a non-believer and he mm. refers to this in the autobiography um, uh, that he writes um, and doesn't finish. He talks about his father being, I suppose, somebody who questioned uh, uh, religious issues all his life, but then he makes this kind of oblique reference to him finding light towards the end. Um, that said, I think it, you can see in Patrick, you can see some influence of that, uh, of uh, his uh, father's beliefs. Um, in so far as that, although Patrick is very devout as a Catholic, he's not somebody who never questions the, the institution of church. Mm. Um, and I, I always feel like in his, his writings, for example, the, the religious belief of the individual has privacy over the institution of the church. The answer is that 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 Sachir <laughs> Yeah, Connemara was very special to Port of Pirate and the Iron Islands and all the Gaeltachts. Like he spent time in Donegal and he spent time in, in the Kerry Gaeltachts as well. And I, m I remember when I went to Inishir first myself in mm. the Iron Islands, being from Dublin, and I said to myself, this is what Ireland was like before the English ever stepped yeah. foot here. So I'd say it was the same kind of thing for him when he came to, when he came to Connemara. Yeah. It was alien to the English-speaking world. Let's see, this is the old school, um, school in Gurt Wall, where Porygo Canila was the headmaster. And Porygo Canila was a friend of Porygo Parish. In fact, it was, he's the guy who um, invited Porygo Parish here in the first place ever. You know, Porygo Parish was in Cunnanagaiga and they were, they were looking for 
and people to teach Irish mm. around the countryside and they were going to the Gaeltic to get um, native Irish speakers. Sure. The, the native Irish speakers had to do a test, an exam, to make sure it wasn't actually to do with the quality of their Irish, it was to do with their reading and writing ability. The headmaster here decided to invite somebody from Cunanagaga to come down here. It was ah. Because he was teaching, he was teaching um, 10 or 12 locals yeah. to be Irish teachers. Okay. Because this place was really, really poor and like there wasn't much farming or fishing or that kind of, not even some fishing, but um, he, you know, he knows, well, this is, these are Irish speakers, we could um, get them jobs, you see. Very good. And he was very, he was very much a nationalist himself, he was into, big into the, the language and the Irish culture. So they sent up to Dublin, could you ever send somebody down? Um, to do the test here yeah. because we're not all going to go up to, <laughs> up to um, and so it was arranged that a kigara and an inspector would come inspector would come down from Dublin and that happened to be part of my parish oh. and that was the first time he came here well they put this plaque here last year and the interesting thing about it is you see they have the seat <laughs> and yeah. you can look across it for Chuck and Fierce he is And it was Sparigo Canile who kind of, once they had bought that little land and he was going to build his, his cottage there, um, Sparigo Canile was sort of making sure the building was getting done and all that. Um, this is something probably my first wrote. Beloved for me is Connacht with its beauty and its nobility. Well, how they remember him kind of matter is that he would have the same time and the same respect and same interest in the, in the little child or the tramp on the side of the road yeah. as he would for the lady of leisure let's say yeah you know so he had he had great respect for all the people there he's really interested in, in he it's said that he could drink six, six cups six cups of tea <laughs> <laughs> so he spent a lot of time into the into the the early morning talk listening really to maybe old people talking yeah. The, the richest language would be from the old of the older people so yeah he was coming here like for ten nine or ten years mm. he used to come here every year uh, or it was like a summer house yeah he yeah yeah he used to come here like he came here to the, to when he needed a bit of peace and quiet actually yeah uh, you know away from prying eyes like if they were absolutely kind of funny things It's said that, um, no, it's said, I think all of the, all except possibly not James Connolly, although we don't know, yeah. but all of the si seven signatories actually stayed there with him at some stage. Well, in Russ Mokwar's house was, um, apparently they did have meetings there. Um, I know when, when he was in Inishmian, they, they founded a branch of Conor and there. Sure. And uh, I know Owen, Owen McNeil was there and Thomas McDonagh and um, Father Owen O'Groney. Um, you, you might have heard that uh, Singh stayed in Inishmian. Yeah. And there's a house in Inishmian, which, which, which they call Tach Singh now, but I see um, it's... Uh, Chachveni, Ch Shan Chachveni is what is the real name for, is, oh, right. is the actual name of the place. But the, they call that um, Ulskal Nagelge, the Irish University, because so many people stayed in that house. <laughs> Hmm. 
uh, and he was he was in Ireland as well. Like his father, as you know, was a stonemason doing things like mm. um, white crosses and altars and so on. And the altar in Inishmian is actually made by by him. And also, there's a high cross in, when you come into Kilrona and in Inishmore. There's a high cross there uh, at the bottom of it. You see. Well, uh, uh, obviously, it was um, James Pierce built that, and his name is on it, and Brunswick Street, Greater mm -hmm. Brunswick Street. As regards his poetry, some of the things that stands out for me are his sensitivity, his mm. gentleness, his love of nature. Mm. And I know when Pierce went to Rusmuk uh, or to Connemara, he would look, look to walk walk the hills and, and up to the top of the hills and looking down the beautiful views. And that's what patriotism is, 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 is love of the country, love of your country, where you're from. This is your country, this is your part of what it is, and it's part of you. Well, yeah, the first time he arrived, I was telling you he was coming um, on the train from. He was coming on the train from Galway to Mam Cross. Okay. And he was to be. It was arranged. He was to be picked up at Mam Cross, and they sent a pony and trap to pick him up. So the train arrived, and the gentleman. They didn't. They had never met this guy before. So the train arrived. The gentleman got off the train, and they ushered them onto the pony and trap and they brought him to Ross Muck and it was all arranged he was going to stay in the headmaster's house. The only thing was another gentleman came off the train <laughs> and that was Parag McPierce. So they so got the wrong person. got the wrong person. And um, so they had to quickly arrange where, where we put him up. So they got a, a second pony and trap and they brought him to this house here. This is the post office in Rosmoke. This was 1903 or something, the first time he came. And so he stayed in the post office in this house here, the first time he ever came to Rosmoke. And apparently there's a, a room in that house now, and they call it Shomer and Fiercy. And that was, uh, the fellow who told me that was Franco Malia. And his father told him that. His father was the man who drove the pony and trap. Uh -oh. And there's still Amalia's are on that shop and post office now. Yeah. Can you tell me anything about Pierce drilling his own volunteers? Yeah. Well, I know that he did. I know that he had drilling in different parts of Connemara and Rusmuck, obviously, where he, he was, also in Spiddle and mm -hmm. in different areas in Connemara. And um, there's a weekend that there's volunteers come down, you know, doing manoeuvres, but they're, they're coming from Dublin, I think, too, mm -hmm. and they're supposedly fighting each other. Mm -hmm. But he was he was very adamant that his, the Rusmuck ones would do better, and they did. <laughs> <laughs> this is the place where um, Patrick Pierce was drilling the local volunteers. But there was actually, um, you know, quite a, I think there was around 40 volunteers from this area. But they were, they were Pierce's own in a way. Mm. They were, he trained them and um, they were separate from the, the volunteers from Galway. It's like he wanted to make sure that his, his soldiers were as good as any soldiers that came down from Dublin. And, um, said that he was generally a, a quietly spoken man but that day when they were doing, doing the manoeuvres you could hear him shouting from one end of Rusmuk to the other he must have been shouting that day he was like a sergeant major they said but generally speaking he was a quiet a quiet man but it, it, I think it was very strong in this area and like there's this man Cullum O'Gara who was from the area he's written a um, an autobiography, yeah. Misha, it was called, and he knew Pierce personally, and he was involved in the War of Independence as well.
but it was Paulie McPierce who got him to write articles for Clive Sullivan. I heard as well that he never got up till 12 o'clock in the mm. day because he was out all night, he was visiting, he was learning Irish, or uh, he'd be out there, you know, a courtier, just let's say, visiting houses and just talking and listening to the old people talk and that, mm. and improving his Irish. The Ross Muck was very important for the Irish language. So, Harry McPierce, you know, came here, yep. let's say, for, for 10 years before the rising. Sure. But there's a lot of other um, people involved with Sun McGregor. Yeah. So, like, I'd say it worked both ways. He inspired them to write. Because one of the things he was thought was important was if we need Irish to be a, a living language, we need to have um, new Irish literature, not just old stuff from the old days. We need to be talking about what's going on these days. So he wrote uh, books and stories in Connemara. Uh, what do you think he was trying to achieve? Well, he was very aware that this was a totally different culture, language and so on. And, mm. and that, that was, I suppose, the hidden Ireland to, to the English-speaking world. Mm. And I suppose the Irish had an inferiority complex. And I wanted to show that their individual specific culture was just as good, if not a lot better, than had been known previously. The different stories are all based in different parts of Ross Muck. I had a sister, Mary British, who was um, quite a sickly child, mm. and I think this might have influenced, um, you know, a lot of his writing, because there's one, one of the other stories, this is about um, a little boy steals a, a doll to give to his little sister because she's sick and he thinks this might help her. And you were telling me that there was a story about a man who used to watch the kids play um, they didn't go to church. <laughs> yeah, that was um, Sean Watchius. Yeah. I was talking to an old man and he told me that Sean Watchius used to live up there and in the story Sean Watchius didn't go to church anymore. He must have had, he had had some disagreement with the yeah. church. Yeah. And um, he used to sit at his door and watch the children play and he told me that the children play down here. So oh. like the story was based right here, yeah, <laughs> in this place, um, because the children still play down there. I think that's exactly the way Patrick was with the church. The other thing I suppose that had happened was in Isagol Nakashkiel and in the title story Isagol, Old Matthias, um, that I suppose in many ways the main character has uh, lost his faith or has had some kind of falling out hmm. with organised religion, and. Uh, by the end of the story that he's reconciled through the direct intervention of the Christ child. Mm. So he's reconciled with God before the priest arrives. Yeah. And when the priest arrives, actually Matthias is dead. One of the short stories on Jarek Deal was about um, the first time Patrick Pierce went to Mass, we're close to the church now, um, went to Mass here. The priest was... Um, given out about some woman in this parish type of thing mm. and he said now except for the fact that there's a stranger amongst us today um, I'm not going to say too much you know because there's a stranger amongst us but he basically read her off the altar 
and Patrick Fierce was not impressed. And um, you know, that's um, that's in that story. You know, like I actually think Pog McPierce was very spiritual, but he wasn't. Um, he was a, he was devout, but he wasn't big into the church authorities. Like even in St. Enda's now, um, he didn't have a chaplain mm. to do at the school. If he needed a priest to come in and say mass or something, he'd invite a priest in. But, well, you know his father mm. was um, probably a, a professed atheist. <laughs> I yeah. don't know, even yeah. though he was, he was a church builder or whatever. Yeah. He was also um, a radical thinker and um, I think he was a member of some atheist society. So, like... Paragma Pierce had, a, had quite an interesting background. He probably, his mother, Margaret Pierce, was probably a devout Catholic from County Mead, but his father was a serious thinker who mm. m- mightn't accept everything to church. So, you know, this is the place where he was going to... Um, he wanted to build a house, actually. Mm. He tried to buy a bit of land here. As you can see, the mountains all the way around yeah. from this angle. Mm. Um, I don't know, he, it, it didn't work out, so he ended up um, buying, or building the house beside, it's a lovely place where he, he picked as well, mm. uh, by the lake. Okay. There was another story I heard about him fishing. Okay. He used to, you know, go out there on the, on the lake, just um, sit there fishing. But he never, he never wanted to kill a fish. I'd say he was a very gentle person. He made a big impression on the people of Rusmoke, I think. Mm. And in a very quiet kind of way, you know. Not, um, okay, he might have been up in Dublin making speeches and things like that, but you get a totally different idea about him down here. There are leaders and yeah. there are soldiers. Yeah. And like, you know, they're both needed. You know that little prayer that was in all the readers in the schools before 1916? I thank the goodness and the grace that on my birth has smiled and made me in this Christian age a happy English child. Christian <laughs> Hadn't shy to ask Grebe, being a burgess, my dear, because we didn't know who slept far down, as you can tell out that Lagos lady done. According to Colm O'Gara's Misha, the local gentry and their flunkies taught Pierce and eccentric. The twin forces of Anglicisation and imperialism were pressing on the Gaelic culture in raw smoke. The English gentry did their best to ingratiate themselves with the local people. They invited all of the children to big parties and they used to hold these on the front lawn of their estates. Yeah, we're, n- we're not very far from Pierce's cottage, maybe a mile down the road, and this was Lord and Lady Dudley's um, their residence. It's, it's, yeah. it's actually a mansion in the middle of a lake. Right. Very, very um, exclusive. Yeah, but they were um, so they were using it as a summer house. They'd come down here, and Lady Dudley, actually, she was very good to the local people. She had um, Dudley's nurses, and uh, district nurses. Yeah. Um, and um, but once a year. They used to have this um, garden fete, you know, where they had all the local children would come in and they'd have cucumber sandwiches and muffins mm. and 
very English affair, and um, they they showed they showed slides of pictures of the British Empire, mm. the wonders of India and Africa and all that. Once the children were fed and watered, they would have a man who came over from London show them moving pictures. There was no party if the man was not available. The films he showed always depicted British military heroes, people who had come from poor backgrounds like the children watching. These heroes had made good or become famous by performing heroic deeds in the service of the British Army. We didn't really see the harmful influence that such propaganda was having at this time. Patrick Pierce did see the insidious nature of what was going on. And they'd play English music or whatever. And um, Patrick Pierce heard about this and he decided to have another party for the locals, but this time with Irish culture. This was called Fla on Thurley Vig. Mm. He soon put a plan in action to counteract what the gentry were doing. News spread and all of the locals, young and old, were invited to a night of entertainment in the school at Turlock Beg, organised by Pierce. Poetry, storytelling, songs and speeches reigned that night, at the end of which Pierce had organised for a man from Dublin to show us a film about the rich history and culture of our own country and people, Ireland and the Irish. <laughs> The whole event left a lasting impression on those who had attended. Pierce had struck an important blow for Irish cultural freedom that night. Interestingly, the English never held another party for the locals on their estates after that. He asked me to write an account of the night for on Clive Sullis. And actually last year, in 2016, that's what the locals did. They had a big fla here with Irish music and channels and storytelling in memory of that fla. Yeah. And when, you, when you think of that, like the idea of the schools of the British Empire were to prepare people to be good British subjects. And Patrick Pierce was out here and he's saying, no, we're not British. We have our own identity. A Gaelic identity. Now, and I believe Patrick Pierce used to leave from here sometimes. The Rusmuck is a little peninsula, really, and it's, we're surrounded by water. So sometimes, um, if you wanted to leave without being noticed, the, the police could have been at the station, the train station, but he used to leave this way. You can get, you can go to Galway, you know, from here mm. by boat, obviously by hooker.
Skosul Gorra Gorra Hitchens Tach Dagon in Shees, my little she said. Will have said Nero in Jim, the Vinci Stach, the Sonic Gall, the Morgus, Tommy Hapkilax and Jim the Fad. A Honic Dinis and our Clan the Hale. I was going to say that it was for Shed Queer Tach. Right, yeah. Say an ask him, I did all Honic Shed Queer Tach. After the death Oft obscured by clouds of woe, thy sun has never set. Twill blaze again in golden glow, thou art not conquered yet. Thou art not conquered yet, dear land, thy sons must not forget. The day will be when all will see, thou art not conquered yet. I, I was working on a project last year, hmm. all about um, Parliament Pierce and our connection with Parliament Pierce and our connection with Russ Muck. And at the end of it, I projected a, a video onto the gable end of the tree there. Wow! <laughs> um, at night, and we had to have it at a... We had to come back at a particular time so that it wasn't too dark um, that you couldn't see that it was Pierce's cottage. But it was um, dark enough that you could see the projection. My father did this um, watercolour of Pierce's Cottage. And it was hanging in our house for years. But we were trying to figure out where did he, where did he take the... Where did he stand when he did the picture? I, I think he did the painting from around here. Right. And the thing is, the thing that gave me the clue is that pointy rock there. It's still there. 1939, it's a long time ago. So what, it, what does this place mean to you? Well, um, because like there was this painting um, hanging on the wall all our lives. My dad died when I was only ten, so there was this painting of Tuck and Fiercy on the wall. So it was kind of lovely to have. Mushikehen Fabrashen Erecheron Pasha Ocho Agasocho Ahnelach Nenim Tu Tu Akkawarin Oh, so come Oh, 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 
so so Avec la warrior thought of wealth to run in your Oh so no